are on Highway 6, Highway 62, three miles east of Meeker, and we'd love for you to be in our worship service with us in person. But if you're not able to join us in person, then please continue to worship with us online. We'd also love to hear from you, and uh, there are a couple ways you can do that. You can send us an email at mammothchurch at gmail.com. That's mammothchurch at gmail.com. Or you can call us at 405-279-2451. We'd love to hear from you either way. And the way you can get that information is by going to our website, mammothchurch.org. At mammothchurch.org, you're going to learn about our staff. You're going to discover more about the opportunities for ministry that we have and some of our special events. So make sure you go to mammachurch.org. Bulletins, um, you'll see a lot of things we got going on, service opportunities. We'd like to remind everyone that we do have a love offering we're uptaking for Felicity Underwood. Uh, if you don't know, she had heart procedure. Uh, she's doing great. Hopefully they'll get to come home uh, sometime early this coming week. So uh, if you wouldn't mind, give that offering uh, either in the plate that's in the foyer. Uh, make sure you specify what it's for uh, or your deacon if you'd like to give it to them. We'll get it collected up and, and get it up there to her, uh, to the family. So continue to pray for them uh, as Felicity progresses and, and uh, hopefully they can get home and, and, and get some rest at, at home. Uh, you'll see uh, Thursday, March 10th, we got the Singing Church Women uh, here at Meeker First Baptist Church. So hopefully we can uh, participate in that. Uh, the Beast Feast is coming up this Friday the 11th. Now it's going to be at Wellston. Um, at the high school gym. Trinity Baptist Church is putting that on. Uh, contact Ronnie Peace if you'd like to attend that. Uh, we also have Unbridled Grace, Unbridled Grace Trail Ride Saturday the 12th. Get in contact with Don Andrews if you'd like to participate there. Food Pantry is coming up on the 19th. Uh, we will not have uh, men's breakfast due to the uh, men's retreat. We're going to have that the 25th through 26th. Again, that's going to be just a nice overnight trip down to Falls Creek. Got a cabin. Uh, so if you guys would be interested in going, uh, please get a hold of Ronnie Peace as well. Get signed up for that, and we'll make the trek down there. It's always a good time. Uh, VBS training is coming up March 26th as well. That's going to be at uh, Temple Baptist Church in Shawnee. That's a Saturday, so if you're interested in supporting uh, and helping with uh, VBS, please get a hold of uh, Bobby Borcheting for that. You can see on some of the announcements we got uh, Glorify coming up, our Discipleship Now weekend for the youth. That's April 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Um, and, and the verse John 8:54 is where we uh, uh, come up with the glorify theme. I want to read it to you. Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is meaningless. My Father who you say is your God is the one who glorifies me. So we're going to be talking that weekend about how we can glorify God every day through what we do, through our actions. So uh, we're going to have a focus on that with the youth group and really looking forward to that. Uh, we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks, how you can help and support that. But any other announcements we need to discuss? All right, Brother Mark. Sure. <clears throat> All right. Before we begin our time of worship, let's recognize anyone who's had a birthday this past week. In the back. All right. Stand up. <laughs> All right. Let's sing it. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. to you too. All right. All right. Congratulations. How about anniversaries? Anyone have an anniversary this past week? All right. Seeing none. Let's begin our time of worship this morning. Stand with me, all of you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down and give you praise. He is worthy of our praise this morning. Let's sing it. Lot of the world. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. All of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am. Say 
We live in a Christian nation. That's what some people say. Maybe that's why they often ask, why do we need missionaries here? There are places in North America where there are very few churches. People are very open to conversation, but nine times out of 10, they have not heard of Jesus. There is no pastors, there is no people can share the gospel with them. There's lives that can be made whole with the gospel. And we're watching God change people's hearts and change people's lives. But I wish people knew how many more laborers we need in the mission field, because it's more than we can handle. Church planting is hard. We just gotta work together. We can do more together than we can do apart. We need all the help that we can get, and that's what Annie does. It allows for more laborers to come here. The Annie Armstrong Easter offering unites us all, big and little, young and old, black and white. We all give because we know that when we do, our communities will look more like this. And we all give because we know there's a name and a face on the other side of that gift. This offering, this gift that we're giving to and that everyone else is giving to, it does have a face. It's my face. This is the body. This is the body of Christ. That's what any Armstrong means to me. Each family. And what we'd like for you to do is pray through the week. The video was telling us that there's so much happening uh, in the United States because of what you give every week through the cooperative program. So every time you give a gift to the church, a portion of that goes to support missionaries all across the United States, not only around the world, but here in the U.S. And so we're going to be praying for all these individuals. Uh, through the week. If you would, on day one, just consider tomorrow day one, and you be praying for uh, folks in our neighborhoods, and then on day two, you're going to be praying for the birds, and then on day three, you're praying for the others, and so on through the rest of the week. And as you're praying, we're asking you to consider giving a gift to any Armstrong Easter offering. And so between now and Easter, you pray about that, and whatever the Lord lays on your heart, according to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, you give that gift based on what he lays on your heart. He tells us uh, in Scripture that he's going to speak to you specifically about that, and then as you prepare your hearts, you can bring that gift any time between now and Easter. There's an offering we'd like, an uh, envelope, we'd like for you to hang on to that envelope and uh, use that as the, the uh, way you give your gift. Now, if you give online, uh, you can specify that it's an Annie Armstrong Easter offering that way. And uh, also, we're going to pray right now for the folks of South Asia. And if you don't mind, we're going to add something to that. We're going to pray for the people of Ukraine. You going to be okay with that? So we're going to do that as well. We're praying today for Oklahoma Baptists who are serving in South Asian with the South Asian peoples through the International Mission Board. And we're doing that because it's a part of our uh, emphasis. Uh, every week in South Asia, 654,000 babies are born. Think of that. Every week in South Asia, 237,000 people pass away into eternity. So if you do the math, the population continues to grow in South Asia where population is even going down in some other places. But in South Asia, it's growing considerably. Uh, the area is home to 2,286 people groups. So it's one of the regions of the world where we have a majority of people groups who are unreached. 863 of these are even unengaged. And last year, 103,000 heard a gospel presentation, 35,000 became new believers, 29,000 were baptized. Let's pray together. 
We're told in scripture that we're to go and make nations, uh, uh, disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. So we're asking you, Father, even though this nation is actually closed to, to uh, Christian missionaries at this time, we pray for those who are our brothers and sisters who are serving in South Asia, and we ask that you give them success and we're asking, Father, that even out of our own congregation, you call out people who will serve in South Asia and around the world. Do this work by your Holy Spirit, Father. And then we pray today for the Ukrainian Baptist Seminary, for their professors, for the president who's a graduate of our own Southwestern Seminary, we pray that you give them courage that they need for this day, especially for the president and his wife and their children. Father, that as they continue to serve people in the area, as they continue to give, that, uh, Father, you would give them success. We're asking that you give them protection as well. And this man and other uh, pastors in the region are asking you for a miracle. And we're joining with them in this prayer that, Father, you would bring this war to a close quickly and that you'd prosper their hand as believers sharing the gospel even in this dreaded uh, time. And, Lord, we're going to give you the thanks and the praise as we place our eyes on you uh, like Jehoshaphat in the Old Testament. We do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you, and we're asking you to do a great work in our hearts, Father. Speak to the Western leaders. Give wisdom to everyone involved, and we're going to give you the thanks and the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We have one more thing to take care of because <laughs> baptism is a public expression of one's faith. And as you've known, yesterday in the North Canadian River, uh, we, we baptized someone. And it was pretty exciting. Let's see if the video will, will give you a taste of what took place. <laughs> and Jaron, you come on up while we're watching this. This is Jaron Welburn. And I'm saying something to him about his faith in Christ, baptizing him in the name of the Father and Son, the Holy Spirit. I'm interpreting again. <laughs> and then here is the baptism. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, baby. I'm so excited. Uh, this is Jaron Welburn. Jaron was baptized yesterday, North Canadian River. We went noodling immediately after. No, I had the, he wanted to, but we didn't. <clears throat> I, I, I gave the statement from Scripture that after Jesus was baptized, a dove landed, something like a dove landed on him, and the voice of the Lord spoke to him, said, This is my son, whom I'm well pleased. And so I said to Jaron, The Lord is well pleased with you today in this baptism. Well, when he came up out of the water, we stood and embraced, and after the embrace, uh, somebody yelled from the bank, there's an eagle. So he didn't get a dove, but he got a bald eagle. All right? So because you have the Holy Spirit, that's why you're baptized, because you already have the Spirit of God living in you. And we're going to pray for Jaron now as he prepares for his move. And this has your baptism certificate and a couple gifts for you. Thank you. Let's pray for Jared. Father, thank you for this brother. I thank you for the discipleship he's been through recently and the fact we get to meet together again soon. We pray for him as he moves to Alaska. And we pray that you give him success, Father, as he's going to be uh, working on airplanes there with the gifts and skills that you've given him. Thank you for his recent graduation and uh, the way you're giving him success in his hand. Father, we pray that you would calm his fears, that you would fulfill his joys, and that, Father, you'd make it abundantly clear 
all that you have for him in the next couple years there in Alaska. He's still a part of us. We pray that we'd be a support and encouragement for him, and we'll give you the praise for it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. God bless you, Jared. All right. The Bible talks about waiting upon the Lord and gaining our strength as we wait upon Him. And it talks about how we will rise with wings like eagles when we wait upon the Lord and He gives us that strength. Everlasting God, He is our everlasting God. Let's stand together and sing. Strength will rise. <clears throat> with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Let's sing the hymn.
so much. You may be seated. salvation and my strength the cords of death they were surrounding me but he heard my cry for help he is my refuge my high tower he's my deliverer so strong the snares of death they were confronting me but he heard my cry
Man, that was fun. You got to jump up there and do that with us sometime. That's a lot of fun. Pearl, do you want to tell us how old you are? 93. 93. Fantastic. Oh, I'm so glad you told us. How many times you celebrated your 29th birthday now? Do you know? Do you know how many it's been? Oh, I'm so thrilled. Anybody else want to tell us how old you are? <laughs> they think, oh, you want Danny to say how old he is? 47. How many times? <laughs> okay. We're in Ephesians today, Ephesians chapter 4. And we're talking about uh, the six functions of the church. And today, it's fellowship. And we're talking about what a fellowship. Ephesians 4, 25 to 32. 25 to 32. Let's read that now. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Are we not? We're members of one another. See, this will preach itself. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. He wants to break up our fellowship. Wasn't it sweet, the fellowship this morning? We don't want to give him an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather must labor performing with his own hands what is good so that he'll be able to give something to the one who has need. And let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Lord, we're asking you to use these words to illuminate our minds, to understand what true fellowship is, to build the blocks of true fellowship. And then, Father, to bring glory and honor to your name. And we'll thank you for it all. And everybody said, Amen. Well, you were created for fellowship. That's why you're in the room today. You were created for fellowship. We know that internally. God made you in his image. Let yourself imagine this for a moment. God is triune. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they're constantly yielding to one another. The Holy Spirit points entirely to Jesus, giving honor, glory, and praise to him. Jesus looks to the Father, and he says to the Father, he's the one that I'm listening to, John 5, 19. I don't do anything on my own accord, but I only do what I see the Father doing. And then the Father, what does he do? He elevates the Son above every name. So they're constantly satisfied in their love for and their support of each other, this one true living triune God. And you were created in his image. Well, you're not a trinity, but you need relationship with your Father and you need relationship with the people around you. You were made that way. You were made for fellowship, fellowship with God, just like they have fellowship with each other. He wants us to have fellowship with him and then fellowship with each other. Remember, Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, John 13, 34, and 35, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. By this, all people will know that you're mine if you love each other. 
So now we see the purpose behind the design. He made us for fellowship with himself and to testify to the world that we're his. If we love one another. Uh, the comedian Brian Regan said, I don't have trouble with much in the world. My only problem is others. <laughs> right? If it wasn't for others, I wouldn't have any problems. And yet you were created for others according to Scripture. Uh, here are some examples that, that give us general revelation. There's specific revelation that were made for others, but here's general revelation. This is what the world knows. We just came out of COVID-19, uh, the, the dark side of that. It looks like things are getting better. But as people were coming out of it, what did they do? They started gathering together for concerts again, and then they would celebrate. Oh, this is our first concert, you know, since coming out of the, the restrictions of COVID-19, and the crowd goes wild. You, you can listen to that music on your homing device, right? You can, so why are we in a crowd? Because we need each other. Uh, fans gathering in public for concerts. Uh, crowds gathering again, sporting events. Friends going on hunting and fishing trips together. Why do they do that together? We're made for each other. Friends going shopping together. People from, here it is, people from every tribe, nation, and tongue gathering together to worship the Lord at his throne for eternity. We're made for fellowship. Well, the need for fellowship is built in. It's in your design. And koinonia, if you saw the, the newsletter, koinonia is one of the most recognizable Greek words found in Scripture. And koinonia, koinonia translated, you could probably translate it for me here, it means fellowship. And a most common definition of the word koinonia is to hold things in common. That's how we have fellowship is when we share things in common. Well, of the 20 times the word is used in the New Testament, some of the most popular are found in Acts 2, 42, Philippians 2, 1 and 2, and 1 John 6 and 7. These verses paint a picture of people who are unified in spirit through common values, common beliefs, common behaviors, and in Acts, we're told they even had their possessions in common. Uh, Acts 2.42 says this, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So they were holding in common the apostles' teaching, and they were holding in common these times of meals together. And so this isn't an official announcement, but I'm wanting to know that it's in my heart and others are desiring the same thing, that we start having meals together again here at the church. I thought there might be an amen or a shout or something, but we're, we're wanting to figure out how we can be spending time together in fellowship because that's a part of what we're designed to experience. And then Philippians 2, 1 and 2 says, If there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, imagine holding things in common with the Holy Spirit. Yes. If any affection and compassion. The Apostle Paul said, Make my joy complete by being of the same t mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. And that's what makes my joy complete when we are one in spirit, united together in fellowship. I know you feel the same thing. What a joy it is to be together. 1 John 1, 6 and 7 says, if we say that we have fellowship with Christ and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. 
and the blood of Jesus himself cleanses us from all sin. There it is. That's what we hold in common. We're all forgiven. Every one of us in here are sinner. And I mean some ugly sin too, not pretty stuff. And we hold this in common. God has forgiven us. And so we walk in the light. We're not hiding it. We're not pretending that we, we haven't been sinning or that we haven't failed in some way. We don't keep that a secret. We, we share in common. You know, that's why we celebrate when someone's baptized, like this morning, often even with tears. We celebrate because it's a reminder that, oh, I've been forgiven too. Eagle or no eagle. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness and the Holy Spirit that you give. Uh, in these passages, as well as others, the New Testament authors present to us a fellowship that is sweet and to be savored. However, this kind of unity of the Spirit requires an investment. We can't take it for granted. We can't say, well, we prayed the prayer and we got dunked. It's going to be sweet from here on. No, there are too many divided churches there are too many upset people with each other in this world to think that it just all happens naturally. You know, uh, Donna and I had to learn the hard way that marriage doesn't come naturally. Not once did we receive this counsel. Just do what comes natural. No, it'd be a mess if we did that. Instead, we received godly counsel. And like the Proverbs tells us, that the one who's surrounded by counsel will have success. So we didn't just have one per person take us through premarital counseling. We met with two or three different couples. And we had them just invest in our lives. And about seven years into the marriage, we both woke up and realized, oh my goodness, we need post-marriage counseling. And so we started having other people come into our lives and speak counsel into our lives. It'll be 33 years this summer. I'm still getting as much counsel as I can. Books, having people talk to me, and we're investing in other people because as we invest in other couples, we learn as well. Did you know a church fellowship is the same? It doesn't come by accident. We need godly counsel. How are we going to love each other? Lord, we want a fellowship. We want a rich, deep fellowship. Well, it's going to take some counsel. And the Apostle Paul is giving that to us today in this passage of Scripture. Listen to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He summarizes it this way in his book, Life Together. And if you know about Dietrich Bonhoeffer at all, you know that it was so important to him in World War II that believers fellowship with each other. Here's what he said. The person who loves their dream of community will destroy community. But the person who loves those around them will create community. Let that soak in. One of the six purposes of the church is fellowship. And it is our desire at Mammoth to move away from being dreamers about community. Because typically that's a false hope. It's like that uh, man and woman going to get married, you know. And they're all holding hands and everything's wonderful. And, and they're expecting me to tell them it's going to be wonderful. And I'm thinking to myself, you barely know each other. <laughs> it's going to be work. It's going to be worth it, but it's going to be work. And in the same way, Dietrich Bonhoeffer saying, don't just go with the fantasy of a relationship. Actually get to know the other person and allow community to build by the Holy Spirit. Well, as I mentioned in the newsletter, one may dream of becoming wealthy, but only the investor finds a path to success. Amen? Uh, if we truly desire biblical koinonia, biblical fellowship, we cannot rest in being dreamers. 
We can't even lean on the past and say, oh, we've had such great fellowship in the past. No, we need to be investors, submitting in love to one another, just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up for us. So what does that decision to love look like? That's where we're going to go today. Here are five building blocks for how you build fellowship in the church. You ready? And, and it's all here in this passage of Scripture. Uh, to experience fellowship, you must speak truth in love. That's following the principle of grace and truth. You've got to speak the truth, but in love. That's the principle of of grace and truth in action. And there are two verses that speak to it. The first one is verse 25, the very first in our passage. It says, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, ridding yourselves of falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. Why speak truth to one another? Because we are parts of one another. Remember, we're told that we're a body. And if you're a foot, you don't want to be complaining about the hand. You need the hand. The hand needs foot. Foot needs a leg. You know, the hip bones connect to the... I almost started breaking out singing there. But we need each other, right? And uh, we need to speak truth to one another. Uh, interesting, you may fall into the trap of saying what you think others want to hear. Isn't that easy, especially in church? You know, you're uh, having a, you know, a frustration with each other trip on the way to the church, and then you get here, hey, brother so-and-so, good to see you. you know, then everything's great when you walk in the building. Well, I'm not saying walk in saying, hey, we had a rough time in the car on the way over here. You know, but you do need to have someone in the fellowship that you can say, wow, it, it was rough today. Right? We got to have truth in love, not just saying what people want to hear. Uh, here's an illustration. This past week I heard again about Mike Warnke, and I bet there are people in here uh, around my age that remember Mike Warnke. He was a famous uh, Christian comedian. This long before Tim Hawkins in the 70s and 80s, he could fill coliseums. I mean, he was dwarfing what Tim Hawkins is doing now. Uh, he could fill coliseums with his humor. And using humor, he would tell an exaggerated version of his testimony. The problem is that his exaggerations got out of hand and his crowds dwindled when they found out that not all the story was true. Now, the Lord's faithful to Mike. Uh, Mike has repented, and he still has a ministry. He still goes to churches, and people are still being saved under his ministry. But uh, he also has that backlash still. He'll be presenting his program somewhere, and somebody will still say, well, I came here just to tell you what you did to me, you know. <laughs> well, look, sin, sin's a serious matter, and he is... Uh, sought forgiveness, but wouldn't it be great if we just spoke truth to each other all the time? If, uh, well, let's go to Romans 5.8. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So when we're speaking the truth in love with each other and admitting our faults with each other, confessing our sin to one another, that's not denying the love of Christ. That's putting the love of Christ on display. God has forgiven me. There's hope for you. Uh, I love this, this concept right here. Did you know that your failures are actually a platform we think of it as a failure. Oh, can God use me? We say, absolutely, he can use you now. As he rebuilds your life, as he strengthens you, as he demonstrates his love for you and his forgiveness for you, your failure is actually a platform for your testimony. You know why? Because other people are making the same mistake. 
and they need your testimony of hope because they're thinking, oh my, there's no hope for me. Look at what I've done. And then someone comes along and they tell their story and they give hope. Then they think maybe I can be forgiven as well because it was while we were sinners Christ died for us. He didn't come to die for all the cleaned up folks. He came to die for those who needed a savior. Therefore, we have a wonderful opportunity to love one another in grace and truth. Now jump with me to verse 29. We looked at 25. Now look at 29. It says, let no unwholesome word come from your mouth, but only such a word is as good for edification. So if there's any positive word at all, that's what you want to say according to the need of the moment. And then he gives the moral reason why. So that it will give grace to those who hear. We were translating the video for you earlier. Now I'm going to translate this verse for you. It goes like this. Before anything comes out of your mouth, just ask yourself this question. Is this going to build the other person up? And I don't mean lying to them, of course. And obviously, I don't mean saying what you think they want to hear. Say to them something that's true that builds them up and gives them hope. And so what I do is I put it through the gospel of grace test. What that I'm about to say is going to elevate the fact that we have a risen Christ who died for us and gives us hope. What can come out of my mouth that speaks to them that way? Because the end of verse 29 says, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Well, that's what grace is, is this understanding that it comes in gift form only, our right relationship with God. Well, what is meant by grace to those who hear? Grace meaning the hope that they too can be forgiven. And grace meaning they are forgiven if they've been saved. They can be forgiven if they're lost. They have been forgiven if they're saved. That's what can come out of our mouths. Uh, this fall, I have an opportunity to teach a class to the prisoners in Lexington. Uh... They're part of a prison divinity program through Oklahoma Baptist University. And why should they be taking divi divinity courses at Lexington? Does that even make sense? Well, absolutely, because there are around 40 men who were selected out of 150 applicants. These applicants gave their lives to Christ. They've been forgiven by the Savior. And they hope to be ministers to fellow prisoners for the rest of their life. Most of them will never step out of a prison. And what they're doing is they're going through theological, practical ministry training, and then they're leaving Lexington, and they're going to other prisons throughout the state of Oklahoma. Uh, I've been asked for us to consider, this isn't formal this morning, to potentially sponsor one of those pastors who will be going out and starting a church in another prison when he finishes this uh, training. And I'm already praying for that uh, brother. His name is Miguel. And uh, we've already uh, developed quite a friendship. Well, if there's hope for him being a pastor, there's hope for every person in your fellowship circle. And we can be speaking those words to each other. Uh, the mouth is the spout where the gospel comes out. And that's what we want to be known for, is speaking the truth in love to one another. But then the second building block is we need to put anger in its place. Anger is going to happen. It's a natural response. We get angry. Uh, there, there is a righteous anger, you know. There's an anger that, you know, is motivating you to take action in a positive way. But we've got to put anger in its place. Look at verse 26 and 27. It says, be angry and yet do not sin. 
Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. Again, early in our marriage, we spent a lot of sleepless nights because we took this verse literally. We thought we couldn't go to sleep till we got everything settled. And finally, you know, somebody met with us and said, that's not what that means. <laughs> you don't have to stay up all night. You can set a time when you're going to discuss it later. You can give each other space to think about it. And you can communicate these things. We will discuss this to resolution. But until then, I'm here. I'm committed to you. I'm not going anywhere. What would be a good time for you? We discovered we could go to bed and get a good night's sleep. We could still be hanging out with each other and enjoy our meals together. Nobody had to have a cold shoulder or anything like that. We're, we're caring for each other, and, but it's still, we still have something to talk about. We still have to deal with the topic at hand, but we're setting aside a time for that. Why do we need to do that as a church instead of flying off the handle at each other? Why? Because the Lord wants us to enjoy a fellowship so the devil doesn't get an opportunity. He wants to split us up. So here's what we don't need to be surprised by. We do not need to be surprised when we get upset with each other. That's not the surprise. We need to surprise the enemy by staying committed to one another and saying, we're going to work this out. Let's set a time. We're going to talk about it. And by the way, I love you. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here because of the grace of Christ. So we're going to put, we're going to put anger in its place. And look at verse th 31. It says, all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, these are to be removed from you along with all malice. Well, guess what? That doesn't happen by accident. Oh, it'd be so easy to, you know, say something you know about somebody, you know. It's, it's a little bit like sweet coming off the lips, you know, but then everything that comes back is bitterness. Woo! So what we want to do is we want to put away these things. We want to put anger in its proper place and set these things aside for the protection of our fellowship. And here's a third building block. Productive people are prepared to provide for the needs of others. Verse 28, the one who steals must no longer steal, but rather he must labor, producing with his own hands what is good so that he'll have something to share with the one who comes. I know what Paul's talking about here because I've been in church a long time. There are some times when you tell yourself, I'm just not going to give right now. You know, I had uh, lunch with a dear brother in, in Oklahoma City. Uh, we went, you know, had some spiritual sandwiches together. And while we're sharing, he confided in me that he was upset with our pastor. And he told me, he said, as a matter of fact, my parents and myself, we're, we're, putting all of our gifts to the church in the bank because we're, we're just upset about this and you know when things smooth out then we'll and I don't know what I said on my face as those words were coming out of his mouth but he stopped mid-sentence and he said uh, well, what are you thinking I said brother you're not doing anything to that pastor you're not doing anything to that church. <laughs> you don't have that kind of power. But between you and God, he jumped up from the table. He said, I got to make a phone call. And he left. <laughs> and I found out the next week he had called his dad and everything smoothed out. Because it's not about the preacher. It's not even about the church. This verse is saying... Don't steal. Be ready to give. 
we got this couple, you know, they're going through this time with their baby. If the Lord lays it on your heart to give in this appeal that we've made, give. If he doesn't lay it on your heart, that's okay. But in the daily life, you want to be productive so that you're ready to give and meet needs, both in your regular tithes and in special offerings. This is why it's so important for fellowship of the redeemed, for each other to discover their spiritual gifts, your talents, your abilities. And, and guess what? Yes, get a job. I thought there'd be an amen for that. Get a job. Uh, did you know that 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, but if anyone does not provide for his own especially for those of his own household. He has denied the faith and has become worse than an unbeliever. 1 Timothy 5, 8. I didn't know that was in the Bible. You can look it up later. So to not get a job is like being an unbeliever. Uh, why? Because we're supposed to produce with our hands what is good. Did you know we had church last Sunday? because there were some people who on Thursday started preparing the sidewalks and the parking lot. Somebody was doing something. Did you know that it looks so beautiful out here when you walk out, and I want you to notice it when you leave. It looks so beautiful out here year round because somebody's working. Uh, we've got some new folks that are, are visiting our church. We're going to have lunch together. And guess what? Somebody prepared the meal. <laughs> Wasn't that fun this morning, the choir? Somebody's working. Somebody's doing something. So ask yourself, if I want to do this building block thing in the church, what am I bringing to the table? What am I bringing? Well, here's another building block. The power of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I'm just telling you right now, I can't love Donna the way I need to love her without the power of the Holy Spirit. Men, you're scratching your head saying, I don't know what to do with her. Ask God. Let him by the Holy Spirit love her the way she needs to be loved through you in his power. These kids, Lord, what, you gave us these kids. What are we, you know. And, and for some of us, it's turning into grandkids. And now, <laughs> what? Ask the Lord, you love them by the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. Why not quench the Spirit? Because you need him. And our fellowship needs the Holy Spirit to do the work in our midst where we love each other through the power of the Spirit. And you're saying, well, but that, but that one right over there. It's easy for everybody, but that one over there, and you know who that one is. You know that one over there. The Holy Spirit. Ask the Spirit of God to give you a new understanding, to see them in a new way, to see them in a new light. You know, for many of us, if you just know our stories, then you understand and, and can be more compassionate. So the last, the last one, uh, a pattern to follow. Here it is, verse 32. It's the building block of forgiveness. Read it with me. Be kind to one another, compassionate, Forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. <laughs> Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I don't mean just Spirit. The person. The Spirit. The Spirit you received when you were forgiven of your sins and cleansed cleansed as if God took all your sins and cast them into the sea of forgetfulness? Well, you have the ability to forgive one another because you've been forgiven. Uh, one of the disciples walked up to Jesus and he asked, how many times do I have to forgive my, my brother? 
uh, up to seven times. He was trying to impress Jesus, by the way. Up to seven times. And Jesus said, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seven times 70. And then Jesus didn't stop at that. He told a story. Because he wanted us to remember. And Jesus said a king wanted to settle accounts with his uh, slaves. A man owed the king the equivalent of 60 million working days. That's a lot of days. And the man had no way to pay the debt, so the king decided to sell the man, his wife, and children for repayment. Well, the man fell to the ground. He begged an opportunity to repay the king. You know, if you'll give me an opportunity, I'll pay everything back. And the king felt compassion, and he forgave the man his debt. Well, the man went out, and he found a person that owed him a single day's wage. Not 60 million, a single day's wage. And he said, pay me back what you owe. So this man fell to the ground, and he began to plead, have patience with me, and I will repay you. But the forgiven man, though the man with the debt in prison, uh, but the man forgiven was thrown into prison because the king heard of it. And he said, you wicked man, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow man? And now listen to these. These are the words of Jesus. Imagine these words coming off of your Savior's lips. The one who loves you and thinks about you constantly and has you in his heart. And while you were a sinner, died for you. This is what came off of his lips to Peter, the disciple. And the king, moved with anger, handed the man over to the torturers until he would repay all that he owed him. And Jesus said, My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother. From your heart. So here are the building blocks of fellowship. Our words speak truth in love, seasoned with grace. Number two, put anger in its place. No clamor, no malice. Number three, our productivity. Serve the church with your gifts, your talents, your energy. Number four, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Yield your fellowship to Christ's power. And number five, forgive each other as Christ has forgiven you. Father, thank you for your word, the power of it. Oh, Lord, we're asking you as a group, as a body of believers, protect our fellowship. Make it rich, deep, and strong. Draw people to yourself because they see us loving each other. And Father, I thank you that you're taking a group of people, not one of us perfect, and you are joining us together as a body of believers, loving each other, enjoying rich fellowship. And we pray it would be all to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you for participating with us in worship today. This is our invitation time. And what we mean by an invitation is we want you to have an opportunity to respond to the things that God said to you during the service. As he spoke to your heart, you may have felt your heart warmed, challenged, encouraged, and you may even want someone to pray with you or to answer some of your personal questions. So first of all, let me encourage you to respond in prayer now to God regarding the things that he has said to you during the service. But we also want you to contact us. Again, if you would go to mammothchurch.org 
and contact us through our email address or contact us through our phone number. We're going to get back with you just as soon as possible. There will be someone on our pastoral team who will be contacting you, giving you an opportunity to share your heart and even share your prayer needs. So thank you again for joining us today and we look forward to having you back with us, hopefully in person and if not, online.